Hello and welcome. Thank you very much for joining us at another Pioneer Pitch and Place Night. Uh, my name is Alec Wright. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer of GSV Labs, and we are all gathered here for a special edition of Pioneer Pitch and Place, focused on companies that are founded by Black entrepreneurs. Yeah, you know, we're really excited about the night and what we have planned for today, um, and to share a little bit more information before we get started. Uh, you know, we are in the business of gathering and pulling together communities of founders, entrepreneurs, and innovators. And, you know, we've historically been doing that through our pioneer pitch and place to focus on different verticals in different market areas. Uh, but we wanted to take a special opportunity and, and pull together a night focused on an underrepresented community of founders. Uh, before we get into an incredible conversation with Carlos Watson, the CEO of Ozzy Media, as well as these eight pitches from, uh, you know, uh, from underrepresented founders, I wanted to share a little context on GSV Labs. Uh, GSV Labs is a early stage acceleration and innovation platform. Uh, we work with hundreds of early stage startups in our innovation centers in Silicon Valley and in Boston. Uh, we have a new center coming online in Pittsburgh early next year. And then we work with tens of thousands of entrepreneurs all over the world through the Passport platform, which is our virtual innovation center, uh, which connects 22,000 entrepreneurs and innovators, dozens of corporate partners, hundreds of investors, 100 plus expert mentors, and provides access to nearly a million dollars in free or discounted technology tools and services. Um, so that's GSV Labs. And you know, if you know us, you know that we historically run dozens of events every year in-house in our facilities. But with COVID, we've taken those online. Um, and, and that's what brings us to our Pioneer Pitch Night series. And in particular, uh, you know, this, this unique Pioneer Pitch Night focused on companies founded by Black entrepreneurs. And the reason why we've, we've picked this, this community tonight and why we're focused is because our mission is really to help all of the world's entrepreneurs, wherever and who are, whoever they are. And we believe that innovation and talent and ambition are distributed equally by geography and race and gender, uh, but opportunity often isn't. And in light of the incredible structural and systematic inequality that we see, we want to play our role in trying to increase awareness and access for underrepresented founders. It's absolutely amazing to think that Black founders only receive 1% of venture capital. And you know we think that it's everybody's responsibility to play a role in ensuring that the technology and venture community are representative of you know, our, our broader society and country. And so we're really excited to use our Pioneer Pitch and Place Night to both have deep explorations of market verticals in different industries, but also over the coming months, highlight different groups of underrepresented founders. So what is everyone competing for? Uh, a grand prize of $2,000 and two free memberships to Passport for one year, as well as a bunch of really unique benefits, uh, like a one-on-one -on -one mentoring session with Reed Christian, one of our judges who's a partner at CRV, as well as an hour free consulting from one of our, our partners, Cooley, one of the top startup law firms in the world. Uh, and of course, the People's Choice Award. Um, every single one of you in the audience have the ability to vote, rate, comment, use the chat. But as you score these companies as they pitch, we will tally those scores and award a $500 People's Choice Award uh, to the most popular audience vote. Um, and none of this would be possible without our incredible community of partners and sponsors. Um, you know, a great group of both technology and professional service vendors that are focused on the startup community as a whole, but incredibly focused on supporting underrepresented founders and their mission to build big businesses. Um, you know, first, we really want to thank Cooley, who's a leading technology law firm that's always committed to the success of minority founded businesses. Cooley's lawyers work with companies of all stages and sizes, from first time founders all the way to the most recognizable unicorns in the market. And the Cooley team is partnering with GSV Labs Black Founders on company setup, patent strategy, fundraising, and any type of, of legal work. Uh, GSV Labs is a Cooley client and, and you know, we trust Cooley with our work and we're, you know, we think the startup community should as well. Uh, we also have First Republic as an incredible partner here. Um, they are enabling kind of the type of banking that you would expect, uh, you know, how you run your own business. 
First Republic provides comprehensive banking services and support for the growth of every business at every stage, um, all delivered through a dedicated team. And their team members, Kyle Gross and Rob Hughes, are, are available to chat with any entrepreneurs that are interested in partnering with First Republic Bank. And, and we certainly couldn't be talking about technology partners without mentioning Salesforce Essentials, which is the world's number one CRM uh, imagined for small businesses, helping you organize your customer data, sell faster, and deliver better customer support. Um, all in one application. Uh, we're also working with Witham, who is providing an incredible suite of advisory tax and audit services uh, to emerging growth companies. Uh, and they're really focused on kind of thriving, long lasting partnerships with the startup community. So whether this is your first company or your 50th, uh, the Witham team can add a lot of experience in the advisory audit and tax space uh, tailored for every unique company. Uh, and on the technology side, we have DigitalOcean, uh, one of the you know, fastest growing and most recognized providers of startup cloud infrastructure. Um, they're an incredibly powerful partner to the developer community that allows startups to quickly find answers, uh, you know, build platforms and use their startup program Hatch um, to, off to provide services that offset early cloud investments that startups are making. And once you have your platform up and live, uh, Freshworks for Startups uh, is an incredibly powerful tool launched by Freshworks uh, to help do cloud-based customer and employee engagement um, you know, across your entire organization. And, and the, the, this initiative currently provides startup access and credits um, across a variety of different accelerators and programs from Y Combinator, 500 Startups, Techstars, Accel, Sequoia, and of course, GSV Labs. Um, and we were able to pull tonight's pioneer pitch in place together as a result of just this, you know, ongoing consistent support from this group of sponsors, as well as some of our other activities, like our scholarship program for black entrepreneurs. Um, if you're interested as a in partnering with us and helping support this community, um, or if you're a you know black founder looking to take advantage of our resources and, and join the program, we'd love you to reach out uh, to the GSV Labs team. So with that, we're going to start the conversation uh, with a quick chat with Carlos Watson, CEO and co-founder of Ozzy Media. Uh, Carlos is an Emmy-winning journalist uh, where he's interviewed everything from presidents like Barack Obama and presidential hopefuls like Andrew Yang to Jamila Jamil, Bill Gates, Mark Cuban, uh, all the different luminaries and thought leaders across industry and society. And Carlos founded Ozzy Media in 2013 with the goal of uncovering the big news and trends today that are going to be defining uh, the world tomorrow. Uh, so to get this conversation started, it's my pleasure to introduce Nikhil Sinha, CEO of GSV Labs. Thank you, Alec, and welcome, Carlos, to Pioneer Pitch Night. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you join us for this important event, particularly tonight when we'll get to know and recognize some of the most promising startups in the country founded by black entrepreneurs. As I was thinking about this fireside chat, I realized that I've seen you in these kinds of situations about a dozen times already. And in every one of those opportunities, you're the one who's been asking questions. Um, so I'm really delighted with the opportunity to put you on the hot seat, so to say, uh, today and um, get the opportunity to hear your ideas, your wisdom and your story. Um, I'm going to get us started with a few questions and then we'll open it up to the audience. Uh, audience members, please use the chat function to ask your questions. Carlos, let's start with Aussie Media, the company that you co-founded and your CEO of. Tell us a bit about Aussie Media. And what is it that you're trying to do that's different from tradition, traditional media outlets? It's exciting to be here. I love what you guys are doing. I think it's super important to expand the entrepreneurial family, uh, particularly as it relates to black founders, but, but really in lots of different ways. So if I can be a small part of that, I'm glad to do it. I'm glad to be here. Um, you know, Ozzy's story is a fun and colorful one. I, I like to say that Ozzy was started with love. Uh, that years ago, you know, growing up in Miami, Florida, uh, my dad loved the news. Uh, he would watch it, listen to it, read it. Even when I didn't want him to, uh, he was just in love with it. And so as much as I loved sports and comedies, thanks to him, I grew up loving the news. And, you know, we would drive sometimes two hours from where we lived uh, uh, outside of Miami to the Miami airport so that he could buy five or six newspapers. He would often tell me we would get out of 
our car and he would say, go inside, buy me five newspapers from around the world. They don't even have to be in English, but just bring them. And when you would come out, Nikhil, you know, there was all kinds of excitement. You know, it was almost like bringing someone candy. And so I grew up loving the news, believing in it, knowing its importance. And I think for my dad, the importance of the news wasn't just to be updated, but really it was to think about the world differently and to live in the world differently. And so when he would show me stories of the first black mayor of Chicago, or when he would show me stories of a com company called TLC Beatrice, um, uh, he was showing me not just an update, but he was showing me a possibility. And so that's how I approached the news. Um, my early career was in business at McKinsey and Goldman. I then later started and sold an education company. And I then took a right turn and, and got in the media and started hosting shows at CNN, at MSNBC, at CNBC. And five or six years ago, my mom got very sick, unfortunately. And so I had to leave what I was doing in New York. I moved out to California here in the Bay Area. And Nikhil, as I did that, I had to think freshly about what I wanted to do next. And uh, with my mother's uh, encouragement, she was a teacher and always believed that you should be learning and growing and doing different things. With her encouragement, um, I ultimately decided to try and start a new company. And uh, for me, I wanted to do something in the news space. I felt like a lot of the news I did was kind of boring and predictable many times that I just would, when I was an anchor, I'd repeat the same four or five stories ad nauseum. Even when you would say breaking news, I would think this isn't breaking news, it's the thing we've been talking about for the last two weeks. And so I wanted to do something that was more colorful, that was more expansive, that was more inclusive. Um, I remembered how much I had loved certain magazines when I was growing up. Uh, Wired Magazine in its earliest incarnation was very forward-looking and cutting edge. You'd read stuff in Wired that you would only see, you know, in the New York Times or on CNN maybe a year or two later. So it was that kind of place. Uh, some of the music magazines back in those days, uh, The Source and Pitchfork, you'd read about Jay-Z before he was a big name, other kinds of musicians. And so that's what I wanted to do with Ozzy, not just in tech and music, but more broadly, I wanted to have kind of a news and information source that was all about the new and the next. Rising stars, new trends, big ideas, one, two, or three years before you normally would read about these people or ideas or trends in the time. So Trevor Noah before he was on The Daily Show, a bartender before she was AOC, a California kid before he was Aaron Judge of the Yankees. So that's really, Nikhil, what we tried to build with Ozzy. It started as a digital magazine. And some people will know now, five years later, we also do television shows, we do podcasts, and we've got a very cool set of uh, live summer music and ideas festivals. Uh, that's a good segue into the next question, which is the, the newly launched Carlos Watson show. And uh, we saw this terrific interview that you had with Congresswoman Karen Bass. Um, tell us what the objective of starting the new talk show and you know, what do you want to sh uh, sh um, uh, spotlight in that show. Yeah, you know, um, um, over the, the last two or three years, Ozzy has often taken some of the articles that our group of reporters around the world have reported and have turned them into TV shows for Hulu or for Amazon or for the BBC or for A&E or Lifetime. And earlier this summer, as Black Lives Matter protests broke out and other changes started to happen, we realized that there probably was a need for yet a different kind of show that would bring more people to the table, that would expand the conversation beyond kind of the usual suspects that, that yes, might have some of the names you know, a Malcolm Gladwell or a Joe Biden or um, a Mark Cuban, but would also welcome people who maybe you didn't know yet, but who you should. And so when we invited Karen Bass, the congresswoman from Southern California, who was nearly chosen to be Joe Biden's VP, she wasn't very well known by most people. Uh, it wasn't public yet that she was being considered, but we felt like she was a kind of rising star that we wanted to put out there. And so five days a week um, on YouTube, the Carlos Watson show, a little bit like a more modern version of Larry King or Charlie Rose is meant to open up the conversation to a broad set of people, whether they're musicians, actors, athletes, entrepreneurs, people who are game changers, people who are trendsetters and tastemakers, who are shaking things up from a quarterback like Baker Mayfield to a writer like Roxanne Gay. We can't have a conversation today about what's going on in the world without talking about the uh, pandemic. Um, what has happened to your business in these last few months? And what are you hearing from your readers and your listeners and viewers about sort of the ways that they're trying to deal with the current situation? 
You know, Nikhil, one of the things I would say, and maybe you feel the same way, the last six months have almost been three or four periods. It hasn't just been the last six months. I think we all went into this with a little bit of uh, uh, surprise, bewilderment, maybe a little bit of fear in March. I think in the back of our minds, we all hoped that by summer, maybe things would be in a different place. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that didn't happen, you know, as things continue to transpire. And we heard about Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and others that also changed the conversation as well. So it has been, um, even though it's been six months, it feels a lot longer, at least to me, maybe to you. In, in, an, in, in a maybe a, a way that makes sense, I think our business has become more necessary. I think more people have been at home, more people have not wanted to just focus on the usual suspects, but turn to different kinds of media. And so we've seen a doubling and a tripling of our audience. More people are reading our newsletters every day or following us on social two to three times more. Um, we've quadrupled the number of TV shows that we either are producing or are on the air. We've doubled the number of podcasts. And so while it's unequivocally been a scary time in many ways and and, and, and a mixed time, there's there's certainly, you can't watch those eight minutes and 46 seconds, and um, at least I don't think you can, and not be heartbroken. I think I've also been excited to see people in the streets and hear people say that it's not okay and that we're going to look and press for different. And so all of that's been exciting to be a part of, and, and Nikhil, in, in unusual and unexpected ways, our business has actually gotten stronger. We'll, we'll grow this year in revenue. I think we'll be profitable for the first time. And it feels like there are a number of fresh opportunities for us to, to expand our audience and do interesting things for our partners. Thanks, Carlos. I want to spend uh, some time uh, talking about the George Floyd killing and the sort of widespread protests that it sparked, but definitely mm -hmm. reflective of the broader set of concerns people have about the way that uh, black African-American people in this country are treated. Um, you know, coming from a media perspective, but also as someone who is part of the community, what's your sense of um, how can we use this moment to create lasting change? And what can organizations like GSV Labs, Aussie Media, and other companies in the Valley um, do to utilize this moment uh, to bring about change in the way that we both incorporate and treat underrepresented minorities in this country. Yeah, uh, Nikhil, I, I love that question. And, and I, I'm hopeful, I'm an optimist. Uh, Dr. King used to love to quote one of the German philosophers who used to say, uh, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And, and I hope that's true. Uh, I don't assume that happens easily. I don't assume that happens without a fight. I don't assume it happens linearly, but but I do assume that it can happen and that it's worth trying. Um, I, I think the reality is that a lot of the folks, Nikhil, who've tuned in today um, and who cared enough to, to to not only build what you've built here today, but but to put their names forward and for an opportunity to pitch, I think it's going to be up to those folks. Because a lot of people we know, unfortunately, are probably going to... Um, lose interest to some extent or get busy in other parts of life. And so I wish I could say that it will remain front and center, but I don't know that it will consistently do that. But a few good people can make a huge difference. Um, uh, and so I think three or four things probably matter. Um, one is I think, and it's hard to say this for a lot of black and brown people who already feel like they've had to be already, but I think we're gonna have to be even bolder and uh, more creative. And and bold doesn't necessarily always mean loud. It doesn't necessarily mean confrontational, but we're unequivocally gonna have to be bolder in what we pitch, uh, who we consider working with, uh, what we go for, when we decide to believe in ourselves, what we ask for. And I think that's important. I think we definitely need more allies. And I think what I would say to the allies out there is that one of the most critical things um, uh, in my mind, is that, is that for a lot of people, many people live in really homogenous communities, and um, they're not in integrated settings. And uh, they wake up in a predominantly white uh, neighborhood. Uh, uh, they go to work in predominantly white places. They worship in predominantly white places. And I honestly think it's hard to be a change agent if that's the case. And so one of the things I've been encouraging a lot of allies is to really integrate their lives in a meaningful way. And especially if that means doing something uncomfortable. So if that means 
leaving a place of worship for a more integrated place. If that means considering living in a different neighborhood, that means thinking about your place of work and is it as integrated as you deserve and as you want. If that means thinking about something else that matters to you, maybe you're a book club person. Maybe what matters to you is where your kid goes to school and that's where you spend a lot of time. But, but Nikhil, I think that that is important. And yes, other things are important, like how our allies um, hire, um, uh, how they wire money or don't, um, uh, how they speak up uh, when things uh, aren't fair or aren't okay. But I think it's hard to trust that people will do that consistently if they themselves aren't living truly integrated lives. So yeah, I know it's a bigger conversation, but those are two of the things that I think about when I, when I hope for a kind of more long lasting change. Yeah, thanks. I think that's really important, Carlos. Um, we're getting a lot of questions uh, on our uh, Slack channel and, and on, our, on our chat function. I'm gonna ask some of those, but one more question and then we'll turn it over to the audience. Um, and this is sort of uh, double barrel. One, um, one of the reasons that we are having this event and as Alec mentioned in his opening remarks, less than 1% of all venture capital goes to uh, black founders. Um, this lack of diversity in the tech industry in particular and Silicon Valley generally uh, is something we've been trying to, um, uh, trying to change for some period of time, but with very little success. So two questions is what can we do uh, again to broaden the diversity in the industry and bring in more Found underrepresented founders? And then secondly, what advice do you have for uh, black founders or women founders or Latinx founders who are looking to break through into the technology or media industries? Yeah, Nikhil, thank you for asking that. You know, Nikhil, someone asked me, I, went, I, I was invited to speak uh, to the Harvard Black Men's Forum last fall. And we were having a nice conversation. Nikhil, honestly, we were having kind of a nice polite conversation. And one of the young men I think got a little uh, impatient with it. And he knew that he wasn't getting the real real. And so he said, what would you say to your younger self? And I started to answer. And Nikhil, he interrupted me. And he said, no, 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 really, what would you say to your younger self? Like, what would you really say? What would be the real real? Not the answer for all these people around us, but what would you really say? And I said, really, really? Said, yeah, I'd say, you know, growing up, Nikhil, my parents, like your parents, wanted so much for me. They were rooting uh, for this little kid who came into the world two weeks late, who was nine and a half pounds, who was eating more than his share, who was who wouldn't make it through the night. And, and they wanted a lot of good things for me. And part of the way they advised me was, hey, you're going to have to work two to three times harder than the next person in order to get a shot. And so my mom used to say things to me like, Nikhil, I never want to hear that anybody outworked you. You know, I always want to hear that you were the first one in the library. You were the last one to leave. Like, if you don't make it, it will never be because you weren't competing at full strength all the time. And that lived with me. And I knew, I saw my mom beg to get me into, I saw her take me to a public school, a seventh grade uh, um, uh, working class public school, realize that I was unlikely to get a good education there and literally go and beg at the local private school. Um, um, and, and ultimately through a bunch of, 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 uh, of, of, of blessings ultimately got me in there. So I knew how much she wanted this to work. And, and so her advice to me was two to three times harder. And Nikhil, I took it to heart. And it's funny, Nikhil, when I would talk to friends who weren't black, you know, in their mind, they would say, you know, I know you have to work harder, but maybe it's 10% or 20%. And what I said to the young man at Harvard, and what I would say to everyone on here is as much as my mom loved me, as much as my dad loved me, as much as my favorite professor, uh, uh, Martin Kilson and Jeff Timmons and all those favorite professors loved me and tried to give me as much advice, George Crawford, uh, if you're out there, as much as they loved me and tried to give me that advice, they got it totally wrong. If you wanna be an entrepreneur and you're black, it's not two times harder, it's not three, it's literally a hundred times harder. And when I said that at Harvard, one of my investors with me got really upset because uh, the feeling was, hey, you're going to depress these people. You're going to demotivate them. You're going to make them not want to compete. And I said, I hope that's not the case. But if it is, I'd rather them know now. Because if, if you're in California and the competition says, whoever gets to New York first is going to get $100 million in investment or a billion, 
and you think that you're competing against another guy who's in California, but it turns out that other guy is actually starting in Philadelphia, so he's at the edge of New York, you better redo your plan because if you compete against him like you have as much time as he has and as many resources as he has, you are definitely going to lose. And so that would be the biggest piece of advice, Nikhil, is, is I think you just have to rethink. Now, do I think it will always be this way? I don't. I think there are a lot of parts of American society that once were 100 times harder and now may be, as my mom said, two times harder, three times harder, four times harder. But for entrepreneurs who are out there, if you want the real, real, and if you want to hear what I would tell you, if you were my younger sister, younger brother, I would tell you, go into this eyes wide open. It's going to be 100 times harder. And it's not just because people are bad people. That's not it. But you, you probably... Um, didn't go to the same summer camps that a lot of the folks did. You you don't realize that all these other entrepreneurs who tell these fairy tale stories about bootstrapping it, well, kind of they're bootstrapping it, or kind of like Mark Zuckerberg, like their dad is a wealthy dentist and they went to Exeter and they can afford, you know, not to have student loans and they can afford to get startup money that no one calls startup money, but that's the reality of the money that they started with or that Bill Gates started with or go on down the line, Elon Musk and the rest. And so the most important thing I'd say to folks here on the line is like wipe the matter out of your eye, be really deadly clear that like it's not slightly uneven, it's dramatically uneven. And if you are going to do this, compete like someone who knows that the other person is getting to start on mile 20 or on mile 22 of a 26.2 mile run. And so you compete like that's the case. Don't compete like all of you are starting at the starting line because like that's a fairy tale. Don't buy into that. Compete like that. Now you can win, but it's going to be harder and you're going to have to be grittier and more organized and more dogged than you would if you also were starting on mile 20 or on mile 22. And Nikhil, I'm happy to go into more of what that means, but it shows up in a bunch of ways. It will show up in your ability to raise money. It will show up in what advice or what trips or tricks or tips people give you along the way. It'll show up in how bold you can be when as a young company, you're trying to close your first deals and you're trying to sell things. And you may not even realize the extra hurdles that you may have to go through to get a test deal, but you're doing it. And so I want everyone who does this to not only know that I love being an entrepreneur, to not only know that I've loved partnering with people to build now two companies, to not only know that it is thrilling as all get out when you go from a blank sheet of paper to something that is living and working and succeeding, but also know that I don't believe the fairy tales that they're writing about these other guys. Because these other guys probably aren't starting where most of us are starting. They are starting (laughs) with many more advantages. And so you have to compete more intelligently and you've got to compete more boldly and you've got to compete differently if you actually want to win. And so Nikhil, I apologize for going on a long time, but that would be, that would frame my set of advice for anyone who doesn't just want to check the box. Like my advice, by the way, doesn't apply to someone who doesn't really want to win, who just wants to say they're an entrepreneur or who just wants to give it a try. Like if that's what you want to do, you can do that. It's easy to do. There are lots of places you can do that. But if you're in this because you want to build something significant, you want to create wealth for yourself and your family, you want to try and put a dent in the universe, then you have to come to it really prepared to compete in a way that you wouldn't have to compete if you went down a lot of other routes. Yeah, I think, uh, thanks, Carlos. I think those are really wise words. And, you know, it, one of the reasons that we have tonight's um, a pioneer pitch night focused on black entrepreneurs and the scholarship programs that we and our partners have put together is really to help some of these entrepreneurs, uh, you know, move up from the starting line and get some advantage themselves. And I think uh, we are committed to the idea that uh, while, uh, while talent is uniformly distributed, opportunity is not, and we need to do our bit to try and improve and increase opportunity for those founders who who get off the start line with some headwind rather than some tailwinds. Um, we have a couple of questions that I'd like to take up from uh, the audience. Um, Ruth 
Sebal Vira wants to know, as an individual that has been keeping up with news stories from a young age, have you ever found it affecting your mental health? Uh, has it ever affected your career journey negatively? Um, I, I think there's no doubt that, um, you know, James Baldwin, uh, Nikhil, the, uh, the wonderful author who, uh, uh, who wrote such great pieces over the years and I think passed away in the early 80s, but was a bright light in the 40s, 50s and 60s, especially, uh, he said, um, I, he said something to the effect that I may not get the quote exactly right. He said, to be black and even somewhat conscious in America is to be in a in a, in a rage almost all the time. And so, yes, there's no doubt that not even just for those who are black, but for others following the news, particularly over the last couple of years, um, uh, can be uh, disheartening. Um, but, but I guess I would tell you, Ruth, if I'm honest, it's never stopped me from saying we've got to go forward. I grew up with a grandmother, um, Jeanette Thomas, who was born in 1902, and she was the granddaughter of slaves. She was born in Jackson, Mississippi. And I remember as a kid, I'd get upset about things. And my grandma used to tell me uh, the stories she would hear uh, from uh, her grandparents and others. And she would remind me that even though things weren't exactly the way I wanted, that they were way better than what she experienced and what those before her. And her phrase to me, Ruth, was always keep on keeping on. And so, um, Ruth, I guess I'm 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 ultimately hopeful that that you know as people used to say we'll turn trash into energy and I know a lot of the news the last couple of years have felt a little bit like trash, um, um, but but I hope I hope we're that creative I hope we're that strong I hope uh, uh, I hope this will be I, I genuinely hope and I don't mean this in a BS way I I hope that many of us will uh, take the last couple of years as a reminder to never take things for granted. Um, don't take freedom of press for granted. Don't take safe voting uh, and elections uh, for granted. Don't take uh, people treating each other with respect and, and courtesy in public life uh, for granted. Like, d don't take any of that for granted. And I hope that we'll, you know, we will love our democracy uh, even more, um, uh, and we'll do more to make sure that it's it's healthy and it's vibrant and that it works well. Thank you, Carlos. I think that's a great note uh, for us to end this conversation. Thanks again for joining us um, and for supporting uh, Pioneer Pitch Night. And now, Alec, it's over to you. Thank you so much, Nikhil. And, and you know, Carlos cannot uh, thank you enough for sharing the time and, and perspective on, you know, these topics ranging from the emerging media landscape to entrepreneurship and where we as a country, you know, go from here in this kind of incredibly difficult time. So th thank you again, Carlos, for joining us tonight. And I'm sure the entire audience really appreciated uh, the, the perspective. Um, My pleasure. Thank you.